Hey folks, Weingart here, and this is the MCrit Podcast. Today we have a guest lecturer. It's George Kovach, someone I'm very proud to have as a friend, one of the real airway gurus out there in emergency medicine. He has taught me so much, and I've, I've discussed awake intubation a bunch on the show, and I've discussed the evolution of my own practice in awake intubation, and I still think not enough people are doing this technique in situations that probably demand this technique. And this uh, applies both in the ED and the ICU. And in that latter venue, I, I think people are more cognizant of awake intubation, but they're probably doing it in a manner uh, that takes a long time and doesn't get uh, perfect topicalization. Um, I, I discussed the things George taught me in my rapid sequence awake intubation we, but what you're going to hear now is, I think, uh, really the definitive word, at least in 2017, on awake intubation in emergent circumstances, which is very different than awake intubation in the operating room. Um, so I think you're going to love it. It is long. It's about 40 minutes, uh, but everything is just absolutely essential, and I think you're going to love it. On the show notes at mcrit.org slash 194, there's an interview with an anesthesiologist, Ian Morris, that I think really adds even more to it to hear uh, the perspective of someone who does a predominant OR practice. So you can listen to that if you still want more after hearing George's lecture. Um, And we'll get to it in just a moment. Before we do that, I just want to talk to you uh, incredibly briefly about the reanimate conference because we just finished teaching our three in san diego for folks that don't know the reanimate conference is uh the ecpr course that i run with my friends joe and zach joe bledsoe and zach shiner and the three of us are the ed ecmo podcast folks and we run a course specifically and this has evolved over the uh, iterations of the course but we now teach it specifically about crash va ecmo ecpr cardiac arrest management and reboa and uh, it's all practical, very little theory. Uh, it is hands-on. It will teach you to cannulate a patient onto ECMO during an arrest, but it will also teach you how to place lines in emergent circumstances in the way you should be because what I've realized is uh, EM, intensive care, they're not teaching this right. It's pretty much like, okay, here's how I did it. Uh, Go do one and you'll figure it out. That's not good. You'll learn how to run a code in a way that brings in the other people in the room. And it's not just one doc standing at the foot of the bed trying to run this thing. So nurse run codes. Uh, Reboa with one of the best teachers out there, Zaf Kasem. Um, You will get so much out of this, even if it's going to be a while before you ever get an eCPR program at your center. If you're interested, go to reanimateconference.com and you could sign up. Okay, let's get to George Kovats on the definitive emergent awake intubation lecture. Hey folks, it's uh, George Kovats here and uh, we're going to talk awake intubation in the emergency department. Now this is uh, the uh, second post on this uh, subject matter, the first one was called Sleepless in Halifax, and you can view that on a aimairway.ca, and I'll get back to that in a, in a minute. Now, awake intubation in the emergency department, even though we, we talk about it, it's something that I think historically has been done quite rarely, and I'll address this, uh, this issue um, we've been big proponents of it uh, here in Halifax and part of our, uh, our teaching our uh, airway program over the years. And it's a hard thing to get uh, experience in for sure. Now, I, I do have to say that I don't think that there are many people um, on the universe that have had their larynx looked at as much as I have, both by myself Um, doing selfie scopes and then selfie intubations, but uh, by others. And uh, I'm not sure if I should be proud of this or whether it's uh, a sign of uh, something else. But uh, um, I I do have a a reasonable amount of experience. It's hard to become an expert on the subject in in emergency uh, medicine. But part of the premise here. Um, on this post is that I, I think it's a it's an underused technique that uh, we should um, be using more often uh, to manage uh, certain cases. If you've heard me uh, talk on the subject of psychology of uh, 
um, airway management, uh, you've heard me talk about the fact that most normal individuals who uh, take care of sick patients are still somewhat fearful of the, uh, the difficult airway. And this is a, a natural thing, regardless of what our veneer is that we show, most of us will be anxious about managing the, uh, the difficult airway, at least when we anticipate uh, um, difficulty. Now, I've had the, the great uh, fortune geographically of uh, living in, in a beautiful province uh, in Canada, Nova Scotia, and living in the city of Halifax. And it's been, a, I think, a hotbed of, uh, for airway educators and, and hanging out with people like uh, Mike Murphy and uh, um, Orlando Hung, uh, who are from Halifax, and, and uh Adam Law, who is my uh, colleague and co-director of AIM, and, and Ian Morris, who most of you hopefully have had the opportunity to meet in my, uh, my first post on this uh, um, subject matter, who happens to be a, a neighbor who lives uh, just three doors down. As I said, he's the uh, previous author of the Airway chapter in Rosen, at least when I was a resident, uh, uh, a few years ago, and I, I really think he's written the uh, definitive chapter on the subject in uh, uh, Mike and Orlando's uh, book on the difficult uh, airway. So uh, having uh, the opportunity to hang out with these people who do a lot of awake intubations has given me the opportunity to, opportunity to learn from, I, I think, the, the best. Uh, both uh, Ian and, and Adam were... Uh, uh, involved in publishing this series of over 1,500 uh, awake intubations with a first-pass success rate of over 93%. The issue comes up, though, is how does that apply to managing the, the patient awake in the emergency department? Now, this is a, a picture that I took one day in our department. There are two cases coming in within about 15 minutes of each other. And the first one was a 38-year-old self-inflicted gunshot wound to the uh, face um, who wasn't tubed. And the second one was a 55-year-old morbidly obese patient coming in um, as part of a post-hanging. Now, again, I think most of us, when we look at the board and see what's coming in, we'd be uh, a bit concerned as they both represent potentially difficult airways. Now, what does the difficult airway mean? I think uh, most would appreciate that it's either difficult laryngoscopy, difficult intubation, uh, difficult mass ventilation, difficult, difficult supraglottic airway ventilation, and or difficult front of uh, neck um, airway access or surgical airway. And there are various acronyms out there to help us identify uh, prospectively uh, the difficult airway, which don't work very well, and all kinds of algorithms that various organizations and individuals have proposed. Um, the Canadians aren't uh, any different with Canadian Airway Focus Group, which I had the privilege of being part of, which is mostly uh, made up, up, up of uh, anesthetists, published uh, the approach uh, for both the anticipated and unanticipated uh, uh, difficult airway. So what we're trying to anticipate or predict is difficulty and, and simply put, you know, is the patient going to be tough to tube, bag, or ultimately rescue by uh, using a supraglottic airway or uh, ultimately a, a surgical uh, um, approach? The problem with prediction is, is that we're not very good at it, and upwards of 90% uh, of uh, difficult airways are unanticipated. But I think in emergency medicine, this has produced uh, um, a scenario that I referred to in the past as uh, Hamlet's uh, difficult airway paradox, uh, to be awake or to be asleep. And I'm not... Uh, an expert on, on Shakespeare, it's the only soliloquy that um, I had to memorize way back in high school a, a few years ago. But the issue is this, is that ultimately what we're trying to do when we predict difficulty is to help us make a decision of whether we should put the patient asleep, whether it's safe to do so, or to uh, have them maintain their respirations uh, during the intubation process. So essentially doing an RSI, uh, versus uh, doing the, the, the patient uh, awake. 
The challenge is, is this, when you think about it, okay, most of us in emergency medicine are comfortable in doing rapid sequence intubations, and I'd suggest that that's, that's what we do 95 to 98% of the time, if not uh, um, more than that in, in some institutions. So then we identify somebody that's, that's difficult, and if you follow these various algorithms, it suggests, well, we should do an awake approach. Well, now we're, we're, we're supposed to do an approach that we don't do very often, that's technically more difficult in a patient that is a difficult airway. So there is the, the, the paradox of the, of the scenario, and is that the safest uh, uh, route to go? I don't think it is if you don't have experience and expertise in, in uh, doing this. But again, is it uh, uh, less safe than, than uh, doing a, a, you know, an RSI in somebody that has identified difficulty? I don't know the answer to that. Now, let's recognize that there really are, are two types of difficulty. There's the one that, you know, you're in Walmart and you're looking at that patient or, or sorry, looking at a person at the checkout counter and you're looking at their morphology, their face, and you say, wow, that person would be a difficult airway. So anatomically, they're, they're difficult versus, the, you know, the patient has got an arrow through their neck or whatever it is, where it's quite easy to identify that this is a, a, a potentially um, difficult airway and has a high likelihood of being so. So those are two different uh, um, scenarios, the anatomically difficult um, airway or the pathologically difficult airway. The other group that's been more recently recognized is the patient with difficult physiology and um, there's a great uh, um, summary on this subject by um, um, Mosier and, and others, uh, the physiologic uh, difficult airway, and, and describing four different uh, um, phenotypes of, of the physiologic difficult airway. But the most common one that we encounter is the uh, is the hypoxemic patient and the patient who is we're not is not going to be able to tolerate uh, apnea. And we're not going to be able to adequately pre-oxygenate the, the patient to have a safe um, apneic period. And this is the patient that I'm doing awakes on more often. So the difficult airway really is expanded from difficult anatomy and pathology to difficult anatomy, pathology, and physiology. And this is the, the group where I think we should be doing more awakes. It helps us develop our skills. It's probably the safer uh, route to go and then we've had that skill that we can use on the patient that presents uh, with uh, difficult anatomy or pathology. The problem has been historically once we identify the patient as being difficult whether it's anatomy, pathology, or physiology we have to make a judgment of whether we're going to be able to do um, an awake approach because the patient really has to have some level of, uh, of uh, cooperation to do this successfully. And this is where in emergency medicine we tend to abandon it. We say yes, we identify the patient as difficult. Um, let's see if they're going to be cooperative and we look at them and for reasons of altered level of consciousness or agitation or some other reason we say no, you know, we're, we're not going to be able to do it, so we justify doing an RSI in, in, in this patient. So this has changed for me significantly over the past uh, number of uh, years. And I've moved from very rarely doing awakes um, to doing them quite commonly. And I'll use some examples here. I've done awakes on, you know, uh, this, this gunshot wound to face. Um, I did an awake, you know, on this patient, and I'll tell you how you can do it in, um, in that scenario where there's blood and potentially in the airway, um, and I used a nasal approach and using the endotracheal tube as a guard for your, your, your scope, um, but that's uh, a bit too specific, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about that. But the awake... Um, you know, really is about proper topicalization, and that's what you you need um, to be successful um, in doing the the awake approach. And you need the patient who is is uh, cooperative to do so successfully. Sometimes um, we need to. 
facilitate cooperation, and that can be done with an agent such as uh, ketamine, which I think is the, the preferred drug to use. But I don't routinely use it. And you'd be surprised at these sick patients um, who you might write off as being uncooperative who will let you topicalize them um, uh, in, a, in a way that uh, is just as good as, as a, a controlled situation in the, in the operating room. So first, before we get on any further on the subject, I want to talk about what the heck is an awake intubation. So my definition is this, is that it's intubation performed on a patient with preserved spontaneous respiration, and it's facilitated by the application of a topical anesthetics. Um, what is not an awake intubation is intubation performed on a patient with preserved spontaneous respiration. Uh, respirations facilitated primarily by the use of sedatives. This is the old-fashioned deep um, sedation and I'm definitely not condoning that we go back and, and do that. If you look at the, the data from NAP4, uh, one of the reasons that was uh, listed as a, as a cause for failed awake approach was the over, over sedation uh, during the procedure. Now a term that I, I I don't like that's that's out there is uh, you know KFI or ketamine facilitated intubation, and I know there are several jurisdictions here in Canada that are looking at uh, um, in the pre-hospital setting using ketamine to facilitate intubation, trying to get away from the uh, you know the benzo narcotic uh, um, route of a medication facilitated intubation, thinking ketamine might be the better agent. Now ketamine's a great drug, and it probably is better than these other drugs. But there's there's no evidence that I'm aware of supporting the use of ketamine alone to facilitate intubation. And the only series that I know. Um, over the published uh, on this again it was a pre-hospital um, study but pre-hospital with experienced providers and the first pass success rate was just over 50 percent maybe ketamine's okay al alone I don't know my experience is is no it does not provide optimal uh, conditions and it is not an awake approach so let's talk specifics in terms of preparation uh, Ian, uh, in my interview with him, routinely uses uh, a drying agent, so uses uh, glycopyrrolate, and he gives it intramuscularly, he gives it 30 minutes before. Some people use it um, intravenously, and uh, if you give it 15 minutes before, it'll give you optimal drying conditions if you wait that long. Now, it's even though we usually have some time to do the awake, I can't say that it's very often that I have 15 or 30 minutes um, before I can really start the, the topicalization procedure um, uh, for, for, for my patients. And I'm just, this is just me. I haven't been using a, a, a drying agent. And, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to dry up the tongue, but it's really not going to influence pathologic secretions of of uh, a sick patient with pneumonia or, or respiratory failure that we're, uh, we're um, uh, managing. But again, I, I'm just saying that um, on my awakes, I haven't been using a drying agent. I'm not saying don't use it. I'm just saying I haven't been using it. Now let's get down to topicalization. Let's dispel one, I think, myth is that you really are not going to get optimal uh, conditions by by uh, aerosolizing uh, your your lidocaine. So by putting five cc's in, uh, you know, a nebulizer and and uh, a nebulizing lidocaine, most of it ends up either in the air or in the lower airway, and we need it to be applied to the the upper airway. Now I've tried this on myself. And uh, some people have uh, um, suggested that if you use it at low flows, you get somewhat of an atomized effect. The problem is it takes a long time to administer it. And again, I've tried this, and it has not been successful. And, and uh, um, as I said, uh, I've had a lot of topicalization done over the years and a lot of laryngoscopy, and I would never do this as a primary approach. To do this, you need to get the gear. 
Um, and uh, what I mean by getting the gear is you need to use the appropriate uh, um, drugs. And, and there's only one drug that you're going to use here, and that's lidocaine. And uh, using lidocaine, 4% aqueous solution, um, and then using a, an ointment, a 5% ointment, that's the way to go. And I'll talk about that in a minute. 4% aqueous should be available anywhere. Um, some people suggest, uh, you know, diluting it to create a 3% by mixing 2% and 4% or d diluting the 4% with some water. Um, I haven't been doing that. Um, the problem that, that many uh, um, people have, I guess, in the U.S. is getting access to the lidocaine ointment. It is available. It is expensive. And as I understand, it's not uh, reusable. So what we do is we just have the ointment. We apply it uh, to the end of a tongue depressor and then um, use it in the mouth. And I'll talk about that in a minute. And then keep it uh, stored on our airway card and use it on the, on the next patient. Uh, so I guess this is frowned upon in uh, many U.S. hospitals and uh, precludes its, uh, its, uh, its use. But I'm, I'm sure there's ways to uh, problem solve that by getting your pharmacy involved and seeing if they can uh, create some uh, individual doses of, uh, of this drug. But it is, I think, critical uh, for being successful in, in uh, doing awakes. Now, the next important thing about getting uh, the appropriate gear is having an appropriate delivery uh, system. And the one that we use is this Easy Spray disposable atomizer. It costs about 20 or 25 bucks. Um, comes in two volumes. I think if, if, well, the one we use is a 15 mil one. Uh, there's really no need to get the, uh, the, the larger one. And you're going to use about 8 to 10 mils of the 4% uh, in this. And you hook it up to, to oxygen or medical air at about 8 liters per minute. And it's got a directional tip and it atomizes your, your lidocaine. And uh, it's, a, it's a great device. And I'll include some information in terms of how you uh, acquire it. So let's go over the procedure how I uh, do it uh, in the emergency department. If the patient is reasonably cooperative, then I'll give them the suction to hold in their hand and they can use it to apply as they feel uh, necessary. I think it's important that you talk to your patient, explain what's going on. You should warn them that when their airway is topicalized, there's this phenomena of, of uh, lidocaine dyspnea. I don't know if that's a term, but I'll use it to, to describe what they experience. It. But when they're when their airways anesthetize, you can get a sense of dyspnea. And I think what's happening is normally when you're breathing, that you sense um, subconsciously the flow of air as you take a breath. And, and you lose that when your airways topicalize. And that can give this subjective sense of you not getting uh, appropriate breaths and can cause some anxiety. So explain uh, to the patient that they're going to be fine during this. They might cough. This is sometimes unavoidable, um, but uh, you can warn them that that's something that might ha happen. Now, I tell the patient that this is going to taste terrible. There are some flavored lidocaines around there. Um, they're more expensive. I've never used them. It's just a bit of a nasty uh, reality. So the next thing that, that I do is I take the atomizer, the easy spray, with the 4% lidocaine that I will put uh, about 10 cc's in there. And uh, I'll, uh, I'll deliver it to everything in sight orally. So tonsillar pillars, you know, soft palate, uh, back of the tongue, posterior pharyngeal wall. And, uh, and that's, that's it. It's sort of one uh, reasonably quick administration they're going to swallow whatever's there or suction out uh, any excess. The next thing is critical, and this is the application of the 5% ointment. So we'll take about, about a centimeter or a centimeter and a half of, uh, of lidocaine, 5% ointment, put it on a tongue depressor, create this sort of lidocaine lollipop. And then what I do is I get, some, get somebody to with a gauze who's going to, trap the patient's tongue. So 
Uh, our patients usually aren't able to keep their tongue out, but they, they you grab the tip of their tongue with a gauze. Somebody's holding on to that, and then you're gently applying the uh, the ointment to the posterior aspect of the tongue, not to the front of the tongue, the posterior aspect of the tongue, so that the the lidocaine ointment is going to melt and fall posteriorly. <laughs> Um, to the region that is most uh, um, sensitive to uh, gag uh, when you uh, instrument that 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 region. So I'm not wiping it off on the back of the tongue. I'm just using the weight of the tongue depressor and going from left to right and letting it sort of melt and fall back. You might have to um, give them a little bit of a break. They can swallow and do whatever. Um, and it might take uh, you know two or three applications to deliver this this uh, initial dose of the lidocaine ointment. Um, I've I've done this. I said on some very sick people, um, and uh, it's it's usually um, well tolerated. But this is the this is the critical piece um, to have them tolerate uh, instrumentation as part of uh, uh, doing an awake uh, intubation. Usually do one application. Of this, is there are some patients that require a second uh, one, recognizing that there are variable uh, gag responses um, that are out there, but usually one is, is enough to do. The next thing to do is to try to topicalize the airway, because we really haven't done that. Um, up to this point, you can probably do laryngoscopy um, if you're doing it um, with each other, but you're not going to be able to intubate the patient at this stage. So um, two ways to do this. If the patient is cooperative and they can um, take a, a breath on command, then we're going to do it nasally because the nasal approach is, uh, is uh, easy access to the airway. So during inspiration through the nose, you're going to deliver your atomizer and you're going to do this on three separate occasions. Um, them taking a big breath in through their nose and then you uh, delivering your 4% lidocaine uh, um, on three separate occasions. If your patient isn't cooperative um, and they're unable to give a, take a coordinated breath, then you do this through the mouth. And again, you get somebody to trap the tongue. Again, the easy spray has a directional tip, the nozzle. You, you bend it down to 90 degrees or somewhere between 75 and 90 degrees and then, uh, and then you spray. If they are not able to take a good breath with that, this is when they're potentially going to cough. Um, so be aware of that. Also be aware of the fact that it's a, it's a known phenomenon that, that patients have obstructed, particularly if they have you know, perilaryngeal pathology, um, to this um, at this stage when you administer a topical to the, the larynx. So at all times when you're doing this, you need to be prepared to manage a, a, a definitive airway. Just a, a quick reminder of that fact. Uh, so, so again, with the, uh, with the uncooperative person, you're going to do a, an oral approach to topicalizing the, the airway. With the patient who is cooperative, uh, more cooperative, you're going to do a, a nasal approach. So let's talk toxicity. And I think there's a, a fair bit of misinformation on this subject. Just to summarize what I'm using, I'm using between 8 and 10 cc's of 4% aqueous, and then about 1 to 2 cc's of 5% ointment. And this is what they've been using um, here in Halifax for uh, um, uh, over 10 years and have had no toxicity to, that we're aware of using this uh, dosage uh, regime. Now, what about absorption here? Um, this is clearly more than four milligrams per kilogram in, in most patients. And that's the recommended you know, max dose uh, that some people have suggested. And that's based on, on uh, data extrapolated from when we inject lidocaine for uh, you know, doing various uh, um, invasive procedures. But aerosolized or sorry atomized uh, lidocaine the absorption of that is going to be um, nothing equivalent to what you're going to get when you use um, it uh, by injection or you use a more viscous uh, type of, uh, of agent 
And particularly in, in situations where I'm not using a drying agent, there's an additional dilutional factor that's happening uh, with, the, uh, with the secretions that are, that are there. I'm not condoning that as a method of diluting your, your lidocaine, but it's just a fact of life of something that happens. Now, the British Thoracic Society um, apparently uh, uh, lists 8 milligrams per kilogram as the upper uh, limit that they uh, recommend using for, for bronchoscopy. Now you can, as I said before, you can dilute uh, um, 4% to create a 3% solution by uh, mixing with either some 2% or diluting it with, with uh, water if you feel that um, you're approaching a, a toxic dose. But uh, again, if you look at the evidence, and I think Ian Morris's uh, chapter on this in particular, his revised chapter, which will be out by the uh, fall of 2017, where he's got over 300 references on the, this subject, uh, is, a, is a great document for referencing uh, um, this uh, toxicity. And I don't think we need to be concerned. Um, you have to balance what's the risk of something bad happening um, such as a seizure, seizure versus the benefit of having a well-topicalized airway that's going to facilitate you uh, intubating a patient who's, uh, who's sick and, and needs this as the, as the procedure of, of choice. So again, I think we can uh, safely use uh, these uh, doses and I can address this uh, on a uh, separate post or, or with some Q&A at a, at a different time. Now with the, with the uncooperative patient, um, as I've said, one of the things that you, you need to do is alter your delivery mechanism. So you're going to have to use a, an oral approach as opposed to a nasal approach. But the other thing you can do is, is um, when you're going to scope the patient is, is approach it through the, the nose. And if you're going to topicalize the nose, Again, you're using your atomizer through the nose. I also put some, uh, some uh, ointment on, or you can use in this situation some jelly. I put it on my baby finger, and I dilate um, the uh, nair that I'm going to use, usually the right nair, um, with, the, uh, with my baby finger. It has lidocaine over it. You can use a, uh, a vasoconstrictor, obviously, beforehand if you're going to... Um, if you're going to approach uh, the patient uh, through the nose. But what I'll do is I'll place uh, a uh, endotracheal tube to about 14 to 16 centimeters. And, and that serves uh, two purposes. One is it essentially is a conduit for easy delivery of the scope. And secondly, it protects the scope from uh, secretions and, and blood um, in the airway, and I've used it with some uh, very dirty airways uh, successfully uh, um, with, this, uh, with this approach. Now again, to talk about uh, KFC, so uh, ketamine facilitated uh, cooperation. It's something that, again, many of us are feeling very uh, um, comfortable with, and, and Scott's uh, uh, work on, on his uh, DSI approach, again, which is uh, another way of defining uh, ketamine facilitated cooperation, the procedure in, in his uh, series was, was oxygenation. The, proce the procedure here is to facilitate topicalization, not to facilitate the intubation. Right, so you you might have to use ketamine um, a little bit uh, to to help uh, facilitate topicalization or to um, facilitate uh, the, uh, the, the intubation by whatever technique. But it's not meant to be a substitute for appropriate topicalization. That's the clear distinction. So how much would you use in this situation? Again, that's a subject matter for a, for a different post, but ultimately end up using upwards of a milligram per kilogram um, I, I don't uh, bolus that. I'll, I'll titrate it to effect. Recognize the fact that ketamine has three dosage ranges. Uh, one is an analgesic uh, range. The second one is when you get into trouble, which is the recreational dose, um, which is somewhat between the analgesic dose and the dissociative dose, which is uh, you know between 0.25 milligrams per kilogram and 0.75 milligrams per kilogram as a rough. Uh, range. Sometimes you can have a non-cooperative patient in that range. 
So just be aware of that. But I, I don't routinely use uh, um, ketamine. I use it if I need to do it. But I think we need to get over the fact that, you know, that uh, the uncooperative patient is an excuse not to do an awake. And I'll use a couple examples. Uh, um, the, uh, the slide that I, that I show at this stage is the slide of uh, me doing an awake on somebody who had a, um, a penetrating uh, neck injury, self-inflicted uh, um, stab to the anterior neck into the airway and uh, had a, a bloody uh, scenario. Again, was approached awake using a, uh, an A-scope um, um, through the mouth and, and done successfully. I've used it uh, in that gunshot wound to the face where the patient had filleted their tongue um, with, a, with the bullet fragments. Again, in that situation, I used uh, a nasal approach where I placed the tube to about 14 to 16 centimeters and uh, I used it to protect the scope and help deliver it to the uh, glottic inlet. Another thing that people are concerned about in doing an awake is, is time. Most, of, most situations we have time to do an awake. And uh, this, this slide, I, I did video this, this case. And, and if you look from start to finish, from topicalization to end tidal CO2 uh, confirmation, the whole thing takes about 13 minutes to do. And uh, this, is, this is consistent with other literature out there is to do an awake approach to properly topicalize the patient and complete the procedure anywhere from 10 to, uh, 10 to uh, 15 minutes to, to do so. So it's not something that's done uh, quickly. You're not going to do it in a crash airway, but most patients, I think you do have the, uh, the time to do it. Now, a few things about position. The preferred approach depends on what, what device you're going to use. But, but uh, most patients who have upper airway pathology or who are hypoxemic, again, they want to be sitting upright. So keep them in that position. You want to drop the bed. So you have the bed low, but the patient's sitting at greater than 45 degrees. Now, if you're going to use a direct laryngoscopy approach or a video laryngoscopy approach, which are both appropriate to do, the, the, the method that we suggest doing is the provider being actually on a stool to the left of the patient. And what they're going to do is ma manipulate the, the, the laryngoscope uh, with their left hand as per usual with the right arm sort of straddling around the head to help guide the laryngoscope in place. And I'll talk about that in a minute. It's called precision laryngoscopy and ultimately uh, place the endotracheal uh, tube. Um, people talk about a tomahawk approach where they're doing it from the front. I really don't recommend doing this for, for uh, logistic reasons and from technical reasons. Um, you're going to be using your right hand with the scope. Um, so normally you're using the left hand, because. Uh, but if you use a tomahawk approach, you're going to be using the right hand. And then you're going to be using the left hand, therefore, to deliver the, uh, the endotracheal tube. And I just don't think you're going to have the appropriate fine motor skills to do it. I can't speak from experience here. Um, I know there's a lot of images out there, of people doing them on mannequins. Maybe it'll work there, but I'm not sure how effective that's going to be um, on, a, on a real patient. Now, this is key. This is what we call precision laryngoscopy. And what precision laryngoscopy is this, is that when you put your scope in the mouth, what you have to do is you have to avoid application of pressure to the tongue. Now, I know you've topicalized it, but still, this, is, this pressure can still be uncomfortable to the patient. So you need to be looking in the mouth. And let's talk initially here about using a video laryngoscope or a direct laryngoscope. So left hand is guiding the scope in. The right hand, which is reaching around, is guiding the blade in the mouth. You're looking in the mouth. You're guiding the blade tip in. And you're applying no pressure on the tongue until the tip of the laryngoscope starts to disappear posteriorly around the tongue. At that point, you apply gentle pressure, looking for the epiglottis, so doing epiglottoscopy. Um, and, and you're going to avoid that initial pressure on the tongue that's going to lose buy-in for that patient. 
there's a, a video here of uh, of uh, Ian Morris uh, doing an awake uh, direct laryngoscopy on on Adam Law, and what you see here is is him again guiding the uh, laryngoscope blade in with his thumb and his index finger of his right hand until the blade tip disappears and then applying gentle pressure looking for the epiglottis and then gradually placing it into the volecula and doing a lift to get a view of the uh, of the larynx that's what precision laryngoscopy is whether you're using direct or video uh, laryngoscope now i think the ideal device to use if you're going to use a laryngoscope is to use a, a macintosh configuration video laryngoscope such as a cmac the reason being is that with a hypercute angled blade again you'll get a a a, a great view um, but but uh, managing the uh, the tube around the corner in this position with a patient sitting up can be a bit of a challenge so using a Macintosh configuration video lar uh, laryngoscope is the way to go. Now some people will question, why would a Macintosh video laryngoscope offer an advantage over a direct laryngoscope? Well, I think there's multiple reasons. You know, one is, is that it's bigger. You know, your screen image is bigger than what you're, you'd be looking at if you were looking through the mouth. And bigger is better in this situation, no, no question about it. There's no what I call framing distraction. Now, when you're looking in the mouth, um, doing direct laryngoscopy, there's all kinds of things in your way. You're looking, there's the blade there, there's the patient's lip, there are you know, facial hair, um, there's uh, the mucosa, and then ultimately there's your target, the airway, as opposed to video laryngoscope, using a Macintosh video laryngoscope, you just have the area of interest um, there on the screen. The other thing is most video laryngoscopes, the view on the screen is a little bit better than the view in the mouth, right? So you're gonna have anywhere from a five to probably a 30% uh, better view, depending on the device that you're using. And ultimately, this is the key thing, is that your endotracheal tube delivery is going to be easier with a Macintosh video laryngoscope than it is going to be with a hypercute angle blade. If you are going to use a hypercute angle blade, just a quick uh, notice ab about that. Don't be too close. Again, there's this... Uh, false sense of security that the more you see on the screen, the better it's going to be in terms of uh, intubation. This isn't a fact. This has been shown scientifically. Uh, we've done a, a study here where we did a, 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 a deliberate restricted view versus a full view of the glottic inlet using the glide scope, and the uh, restricted view had a higher success rate. And we've all been in this situation where there's a an access challenge or an advancement challenge with an endotracheal tube when we're using a hypercute angled uh, video uh, laryngoscope. So again, what you want to do is uh, you you don't want to have that full view of the glottic inlet where you're 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 looking at the cords, but when you look through the cords, what you're seeing is the anterior wall of the trachea. You might see the cricoid ring there, or even the tracheal rings there. Um, that's a scenario where you're going to have a challenge in terms of uh, placing the tube. You want to have more of a strict, restrictive view. We call it sort of a 50-50 view, where at least when you're using the glide scope, um, the epiglottis is in view. It's hugging the top of your uh, uh, video laryngoscope screen, and uh, you have a pogo of about 40% or less. And the glottic inlet occupies just the top 50% of the uh, of the of the screen, that's the the preferred um, approach or view when using a glide scope. Um, that prevents over rotation of the uh, of the blade and allows for easier tube delivery. Um, so when you use this uh, approach of a restrictive view versus having a full view. So that applies whether you're doing it as part of an RSI, but also doing it um, as part of an awake approach. Now, what do I use? I, I'm a big believer of, of using um, a, a flexible scope. A bit about terminology, a bit of a, a pet peeve. We're not using a, a, a bronchoscope. I'm not doing bronchoscopy. I'm using it for uh, intubation. 
and it's not a, a fiber optic uh, device anymore. It's a video device. So the preferred terminology for me is a flexible intubating endoscope. And uh, the, the game changer for me has been the A-scope. Uh, if you have a reusable device, then all the power to you. The issue and challenges is maintenance and cost of, the, of that device. Um, but the A scope is a is a is a great device. Comes in three sizes: a slim or pediatric version, the uh, standard adult one, and now it comes in a, in a larger size, which is the one that we're going to go with, because it has a a larger suction channel, and this allows us to manage secretions more effectively. I don't have experience yet with it, but I, I think it's a promising one. And that's the one that uh, um, we're going to use. I've been using the, the standard one. Occasionally, in special circumstances, I'll use the, uh, the pediatric uh, one if uh, the pathology dictates um, uh, um, such. Again, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great device. You can record a video on it. And if you want to watch me uh, um, on uh, YouTube, I've got a, a couple posts um, out there of not only me um, you know, looking at my larynx, but actually passing an endotracheal tube and uh, going through the uh, topical uh, uh, approach uh, to uh, the airway. Now, just to, to finish off with, as I said, we can gain more experience in doing the awake approach on the physiologically difficult uh, airway and the patient who's not going to tolerate apnea and that makes up a fair number of our patients in the emergency department. We gain experience uh, here. I'm not suggesting that's where you learn it, but we gain experience here so then we can uh, then uh, use this approach uh, uh, with a higher likelihood of success when it's an anatomically or pathologically uh, difficult airway. In terms of learning the skill, again, there's no shortcut. Uh, you have to practice, and and uh, I don't think it's it's mechanically that challenging. I really don't. It's uh, it's about uh, you know uh, getting uh, some fidelity with your with your right hand on the uh, scope to maneuver it. It's really about uh, uh, moving your thumb and moving your wrist and keeping the rest of your arm stable and. But just getting practice, and you got to get that practice on on the usual suspects, meaning uh, mannequins, and and how do you transition to doing it uh, on on real patients? Uh, well, I think one of the ways is to do it uh, on each other. And as I've said, I've, I've done this uh, a lot on, on on myself, and had other people do it on me. But uh, what we do as a group with our residents is we do. You know, an awake uh, laryngoscopy a day where, you know, they topicalize each other and they get uh, a sense of what the approach is, um, how they're going to hold the device, uh, whether it be a video uh, a laryngoscope or a flexible scope, um, and at least get a look at the airway. And uh, as I said, perfect the, uh, the approach to applying uh, topicalization because that's going to be um, your, your key to uh, success. So that's my take on uh, awake intubation in the emergency department. Uh, at the end of the day, when you sink the tube and you get your positive end tidal CO2, you got to be immediately um, prepared to sedate your patient and have your drugs available and, and do so. So the challenge is that I'm going to put out there is let's do more awakes. Let's talk about it more in the uh, emergency medicine and critical care environment. I, I think it's a, it's a great approach for us uh, to do. It should be part of our armamentarium in uh, managing the, the difficult airway. I hope you've uh, found this uh, useful. Take care.